Hello and welcome back to Philosophy and Humor. And this week we're going to start the two-part section, Module 12, Laughter and the Limits of Understanding. If you have the book, this one here, the John McDonald book, uh, you'll notice that the chapter is only about six pages long. So it's short, but it's dense with, in with information, much like the previous chapter was, which is why I wanted to take at least a couple of weeks to go through the material. A lot of interesting stuff that we, we looked at already, and that we're going to look at this week and next week. As a matter of fact, uh, next week, the second half of this uh, this part on uh, the limits of understanding, most of it will be coming out of this book right here, uh, Noel Carroll's Humor, a very short introduction. Not very big, but also very, very dense with information. So as we normally do, we go through the previous module, and I want to look at the second half of Humor and Modernism. And here we talked about uh, some of the comic themes that tie together with uh, spiritual themes, religious kinds of uh, thinking, and in particular, this idea of unworlding, right? Uh, having two worlds coexist and kind of interpenetrate like that. Uh, in this way, we don't have a clear distinction, a clear separation between the natural and the supernatural or the secular and the sacred world. They, they co-mingle, right? They interact with each other. And in that interaction is the room for individuals to, to question religious ideas and spiritual ideas. Whether it's in a parodic or satirical form, there's the room to explore. Right? And that's what that unworlding effect does in comic fiction. Now, with that in mind, it sounds pretty heady, right? And uh, philosophy is also pretty, uh, you know, ethereal and cerebral and so on. But surprisingly, there is a lot in common between humor and philosophy. We've talked about this before. And also between uh, humor, philosophy, and stand-up comedians in particular. And the parallels between the two, fairly straightforward, uh, always using imaginary characters and talking about uh, situations that may or may not have occurred. Uh, and if they have, they're probably stretched a little bit. Uh, the truth factor may be stretched maybe to the limit, but for comedic effect. Uh, everyday experience uh, is typically the content of most uh, stand-up routines. Uh, there's a kind of detached, almost anthropological view of the world that's filtered through this very humorous lens. Uh, shifts in perspective, where the stand-up comedian can adopt different characters, adopt different voices, different accents, different sort of facial characteristics. And so it is a kind of one-person show, and the comedian can talk and speak philosophically uh, about the world, but always for a kind of humorous effect. Another way they do it is the, the typical what-if format, right? You know, what if animals could talk, and what if whatever? And so what happens is we can explore the world and we explore it humorously. And often there's a kind of sugar-coated pill that goes along with it. And by that, I mean, there could be lessons to be learned from the comedian as we listen to the routine. Uh, because typically, uh, whenever you parody something, you care about it. So you want us to, you want us to laugh, but you also want us to question, uh, the comedian that is, they would like us to question our value system, right? Is this worth considering? Is this worth believing in? And if it reaffirms your your uh, you know belief system, your morals, your ethics, great. If it makes you question them and walk away, that may be a good thing because it could be based on prejudices and biases that we have, which are often difficult to identify because they're kind of built into who we are, right? We don't see them until someone points them out. So if we can do that, we also reserve the right to challenge authority, which is probably the greatest gift that stand-up comedians have. Uh, they're kind of like the court jester uh, that is allowed to make fun of the king. Well, if anyone else were to do this, you'd lose your head, literally. So these kinds of things we need to think about when we are looking at this comparison. Uh, not, a, not a contrast, but in fact a comparison, how similar the two of them are, stand-up comedy and philosophy. And people like Lenny Bruce, uh, Bill Hicks, they went after the institutions of society, in particular religious institutions. And it's not as if they were not, uh, or they were atheists. They were not big fans of hypocrisy. And that's really what they're, what they're going after. Hypocrisy of any kind. And you can find it in politics. You can find it in, you know, everyday activities, people lying, you know, behind your back and, and talking to your face. Uh, exactly the opposite. That, that's hypocritical. But certainly one of the links between all three, Lenny Bruce, Bill Hicks, and Russell Brand, is the fact that they do talk about religious issues. 
And that's typically not somewhere you would find, right, the stand-up routine where you would find this kind of discussion, but it's worth considering. And with Russell Brand, uh, he speaks of, of spiritual matters, but he does it in a way that we're not quite sure whether we should be only laughing at it or laughing and thinking at the same time. And I would kind of hazard a guess it's the second one, right? When you laugh about something, you confirm to yourself what should be. And so if you're laughing about what people are not doing, you're also telling yourself, well, they should be doing something else, right? What is that something else? Uh, whether it is to think spiritually, you know, sp uh, think in a kind of connected sort of way. Um, that's what Russell Brand does. He, he talks about the kinds of topics you would expect the, the Dalai Lama to, to discuss, but he does it in a, in a comedic way. And it's, it's a very effective way to, to talk about truths, right? So stand-up comedians do have that flexibility, right? To kind of push the truth a little bit, twist it and expand it and contract it in different ways because they're talking about truths that may be uncomfortable, uh, may not be discussed very often, but the platform of a stand-up comedian is such that we can express truths that are otherwise difficult or are not voiced in society very often. So we can call into question the world, call into question the way we, we see the world in, in the way that is perhaps biased. So we wanna make sure that we can do that. Perhaps one of the, the greatest biases that we've had since the dawn of civilization really is patriarchy, which is a form of thinking which is very pervasive and pernicious, uh, a kind of thinking that has basically made women second-class citizens. Uh, for a very, very long time. So if stand-up comedians can question authority, can question religion, then there's no reason why uh, feminists can question patriarchy. It is probably the largest institution that is also the most invisible until someone points it out to you. So Hélène Sissou and other French uh, feminists, they're not necessarily humorous. They're not stand-up comedians. They are writers, but they are writers uh, who are very, very aware of how language works and how language is fundamental to our identity. Not only the way in which we connect with each other, with ourselves, right, our inner voices, our thoughts, um, our external reality, we, we connect to the world by de describing it and discussing it with others, confirming it to ourselves. And so humor and laughter in this case is a laughter of recognition, but it can also be a laughter of defiance. And this is kind of segueing into what we're going to talk about today. So laughter and humor become the sound of defiance for women who are pushing back on these patriarchal roles that have been assigned to them for many thousands of years. And by turning around and pointing it out to us, uh, to some people, maybe seeing something for the first time. And in, in the same way as Bill Hicks and Russell Brand and Lenny Bruce talked about religion in unique kind of ways, there are thinkers, and if certainly there are lots of female stand-up comedians that kind of do the same thing regarding patriarchy. Uh, gendered roles. Uh, you've probably have heard this term before, but gender role in, roles in society are kind of uh, expected roles, typical roles that are played by men or women. And what stand-up comedians, the, the female uh, variety, uh, they can turn those things on, on their heads. And we start realizing that there is a sense of liberation in talking about these ideas in certain, some cases for the first time. And so it is really important to allow these voices to be heard because you have one of three things going to happen. There could be a shred of, of truth in that one statement and we kind of bring it out into the open and, and we test it. So if it confirms that the status quo as being correct, that idea is considered foolish. But if we are able to think about it and change our ways, then it is not foolish. Maybe it's worth hearing in the first place. So that's kind of how we're going to segue into the last two uh, sections. Well, two parts of the last module. And here we're talking about the limits of meaning. Uh, wow, it kind of sounds heavy duty. And it can be because uh, these are people, these philosophers, uh, we're talking grad school stuff here. But what I want to do is introduce you to at least the ideas. Now, we're not going to go down the rabbit hole with Jean-Luc Nancy or Derrida and some of these people, but let's look at how these few ideas that they present kind of marry up really nicely with what we've been talking about in terms of humor and language. Okay, 
So one thing postmodernism has taught us is that laughter represents the limits, if not the absence of meaning. So what is postmodernism? It's uh, self-reflection. Uh, everything is relative. There are no authority figures. Uh, anything goes, right? High, low culture mix all together. So if we are laughing at it and we're laughing at the absurdity of it, we may also be laughing at the fact that these new sort of combinations lack meaning beyond just their immediate reality. Uh, if we're going to combine high and low together, does it mean anything more than just simply the combination? Perhaps it does, perhaps not. It depends. But here, when we were talking about uh, postmodernism and laughter, laughter kind of represents the degree to which we have to let go and say, this doesn't make any sense, but it's somehow the way we live. And this is kind of uh, what we're going to look at sort of very briefly here. So hopefully, uh, bear with me. Um, it's really interesting. And if you ever, if you get to grad school, you can deep dive into this stuff. Fascinating, at least for me. Hopefully it will be for you. Okay, so let's kind of pick it apart here. So Jean-Luc Nassi, this is the gentleman you see here. He is using laughter as a way to respond to this very important philosophical idea that Jacques Derrida, that we'll see in the next slide, presented to the world in the 19, let's say the late 60s, early 70s. And what this thing was, was this idea of difference, right? Now, uh, difference, difference is something that is, that is different, not the same, but difference is something that is uh, a really kind of fascinating way to look at the way language operates. So, it, it's a buzzword, but I mean, it's been a, a buzzword for 40 years. Um, but what, dif, uh, what difference is, it's the idea that meaning is absent because when we try to describe something using words, we're stuck having to use other words. We are not able to ever give it a final, a final statement. And even if that final statement were there, it would still be made of words. So what Derrida is saying is, in terms of difference, we're endlessly pushing away the ultimate meaning of something by simply always having to rely on language and on words to describe something. So I describe something to you, and short of me just pointing to it because it, it occurred yesterday or last year or, or, you know, or never, and it's hypothetical, I am using words to commu communicate to you a particular idea and there is room for error to say the least because if meaning is absent or it's deferred and constantly pushed away by yet more words um, everything is sort of deferred along this chain right that just never seems to end so it is kind of strange so let's have a look at it here so difference this word that Jacques Derrida this gentleman here came up with it kind of means three things at once. Notice that it's not spelt the same way. Uh, difference, right, is usually e e n s. So, so there is the noun uh, difference or a difference spelled with an e. There is also the idea of co collapsing the noun difference into the verb differer or to di to differ or to defer. So, differ simply means this is not that. But to defer is to constantly push away. Well, what I mean is this. What, what I mean really is this. Right? And this and this constantly is on an endless chain of words. And finally, this kind of, uh, this objective différent, right? The, the condition, which it's still a verb. It's the act of me constantly trying to grasp a reality to you, but I'm never able to do it because all I can do is use words. And these words constantly point away from me, right there. The, the whole idea of language is metaphoric. What does that mean? It stands in for something else. Language can be symbolic, but it's ultimately metaphoric. And a metaphor is something that stands in for something else. And so what's happening is, um, language is, it's slippery. It's, it has constant slippage, uh, because we may describe something to ourselves in our mind, something we see. Then we describe it to someone else and they may have a slightly different understanding of those terms. Uh, and so their understanding may not be exactly the same as 
what you saw and thought you described. So you describe it again. And then there's a, an exchange back and forth. So you are talking about difference. No, no, it was this that happened. But you're deferring away constantly that ultimate meaning. So it is a philosophical concept. It is a, a little bit on the difficult side. I understand if you're hearing it for the first time. But if you think about what difference is, uh, it might be a little bit easier. And what it is, it's, is this. Words are never in direct contact with reality, right? Language is metaphoric. It is something that stands in for the real thing. Okay, so here's a cup, right? I take the cup away from the, from the camera and I say the word cup. Now, if you hadn't seen that and I simply said the word, let's say 10 of you would, would imagine 10 different kinds of cups. Now, it could be tall, short, wide, whatever. It could be something written on it. That's why words are never in direct contact with reality. They simply kind of stand in for reality. And so we just kind of agree that a certain sound we make with our mouths or, or little graphic things on paper mean something. And those words can change constantly. And uh, a flexible, fluid, you know, hot, slippery language is constantly changing, evolving, dropping off words, uh, you know, accruing other words. And these kinds of things make language a difficult thing to pin down. So really what happens is word sounds and word meanings are arbitrary, right? We agree to them. A society agrees that at some point a certain word means something and another time it does not, right? And things just sort of slip in and out. Now, if that's the case, the original meaning of that word doesn't exist, right? It's the, the truth of that word is kind of, it's kind of absent, right? And this is, again, this is language at the, uh, sorry, laughter at the limits of understanding. So we're, we're on the limits here. We're, we're pushing just a little bit too far and understanding what language can and cannot do. So, uh, original meaning and truth are largely absent, uh, or faintly present in the traces that are endlessly deferred. Uh, Jimmy Tatro, I think this clip really exemplifies what I'm talking about. So Jimmy Tatro is trying to explain to his friend what Bitcoin is. So, Pay careful attention. You'll understand what deferring and difference actually means after you watch this clip. And again, it should be right down here. I will make sure to post them. Uh, have a look at Bitcoin guy, but uh, Jimmy Tatro and his buddy, uh, and you'll understand what difference is because Mr. Tatro has a really tough time des describing it. So enjoy, and I'll see you back in a moment. Okay. So we're kind of moving along in this sort of shaky world where language is slippery and fluid and always changing. And so when we're trying to tell the truth, it's not easy, right? Truth can only be grasped through language. We exist in and through language. Our relationships with each other, our relationships to reality, uh, our relationships to metaphysical things, supernatural things, all of those exist only through language. They can, the only way we can grasp them. And so when we're at a point where everything's relative, there is no authority, anything goes, you're kind of on shaky ground here, right? So it's our inability to ever pin down meaning ultimately that uh, Nasi, uh, Jean-Luc Nasi here, he calls it transcendental laughter. And so why is it laughter? Well, because it's a kind of like, oh, well, <laughs> that's really all it is. That's really all transcendental laughter is. Um, no, it's the world is not made of black, white, one, two, up, down, you know, um, these what are called binary oppositions, ones and zeros, right? If you're a computer person, the world isn't ones and zeros. It's lots of everything else. So there are lots and lots of indeterminacies, right? Um, uh, you know, sort of indefined, uh, ephemeral, transitory things that all kind of come in our purview, right? Back and forth. And if things are indeterminate and we have difficulty expressing the final meaning of something, do we go mad or do we just laugh? Well, Nancy says, we'll just laugh. Derrida's idea is fine. This, this difference thing, you know, endlessly deferring meaning down this long chain. Um, is that going to drive you crazy? It could. But really, all we should do is simply laugh. We just laugh at it, say, you know, that's it. It just just escaped. <laughs> it just flew away. And so transcendental laughter is a laughter that simply shrugs its shoulders and says, well, it's the best I can do. 
right? Uh, this is what I think I'm trying to say. So transcendental laughter is the knowledge of a condition of possibility, which gives nothing to know. There's nothing comic about it. Uh, there's, it's, it's neither nonsense nor irony. This laugh does not laugh at anything. It laughs at nothing, for nothing. So it laughs at nothing in the sense that indeterminacy and vagueness and that endless deferral of words, you know, as we try to explain one word using another word. I mean, think of, explain to someone the color blue. How could you do that without using words? The color red, any color for that matter. So if that is the, the case, uh, and if you want to get into an argument about that, say, well, it's really easy. Two people, both of you describe the color blue. Guarantee you're going to have two different colors, two different shades at least. And I don't know if men can see taupe. I don't think men wear anything that's made of taupe. Uh, we just can't see it. We just go kind of a brownie beige. Oh, it's taupe. Whatever. But that's what I mean. Transcendental laughter is a laughter that that really sort of joyously says, I'm laughing at nothing. I, I can't come up with any other way to describe it. And those are the limits, right? The limits of meaning. And the limits sound like laughter because we're we're at the abyss, right? We can't go any further because we're going to simply just keep using more and more words. So if that's the case, um, and we have no authority figures, uh, we have no sort of other voice we can turn to because remember, right? If somebody comes along and says, I have the answers, we're supposed to back off, right? Because we're supposed to question authority. So postmodern laughter of this kind, right? Is disconnected from this notion of, of superiority. Uh, incongruity and, rel and relief theory. It's a, it's a different kind of thing. And it is, you could look, you could say it is tragic because it is the inability to ever ultimately mean what you, what you say and say what you mean. Um, that's almost a kind of a psychological condition because it's true. Many of the problems that uh, we have in our lives stem from trying to say what we mean and mean what we say. And that's maybe another way to to kind of describe what I've just been trying to trying to describe. Right here, I am trying to describe to you in words that aren't exactly the same, and we look at it from this perspective and that perspective. And so there is a kind of tragic sort of center in this attempt to to create meaning, to use words to talk about other words, because really that we're in a kind of hall of mirrors, right? Everything we're in this bubble that we are trying to get out of. And the, okay, so that's my phone. I'm going to ignore it. Anyway, um, so postmodernism, how is that thing loud? Sorry about that. I had to turn the phone off though. Okay, let's get back to what we're talking about here. Postmodernism, lack of meaning, that tragic core. Um, ultimately, we can look at it one or two ways. We can be very sad about it and think that's a tragedy. Or, because this is not a philosophy class, but a humor class, we can just embrace it, right? We laugh. We laugh at the absurdity of not being able to describe what, or to say what we mean and mean what we say. So it's not a tragedy. It's just simply a way of looking at the world. So, that is essentially sort of the idea behind all of these things. Now, um, there is, sure, that tragic core, and we listen and we try to make sense of what people are saying. Uh, in, in this particular clip, and uh, neuropa uh, neuropathetic quesadillas, this is, uh, this is a crew that <laughs> makes these very funny videos called You Suck at Cooking. If you like this one, uh, certainly go to, God, I sound like I'm running a YouTube channel, but uh, have a look at some of the other ones. They are quite silly and ridiculous, but they, to me, to my mind, really play with the absurdity of language. They, in this case, trying to make uh, quesadillas, uh, and just trying to follow the recipe is going to be kind of difficult, but certainly it is literally at the limits of what you could do to prepare a meal. So have a look at our, uh, our naturopathic quesadillas and we'll see you back in a moment. Okay. See what I mean? So quite insane, quite ridiculous and quite absurd, but we're laughing, right? We're, we're just literally throwing up our hands up going, okay, it is what it is. Okay. So we've talked up to this point, uh, the first half of the course, we talked about superiority theory, incongruity, relief theory, 
play theory a few weeks ago. And one of the theories that comes out of, uh, in this case, it would be the modernist period, right, the, of modernity, which is kind of a period that starts more or less around the 1850s. And one of the ideas that comes out of that period of writing, uh, because Baudelaire would have been writing in the 1860s, uh, Baudelaire presents to us a new idea that we can consider in this context of absurdity and unable to, to grasp meaning, meaning using language. And what Baudelaire is presenting to us is what he calls the inferiority theory of humor. And that's a rather interesting one <clears throat> because, okay, 1855, so it was off, it's pretty close. So in the essence of laughter, Baudelaire uh, gives us this idea of laughter, which is, it aligns very well with Plato and it's perhaps what Plato should have called his superiority theory because Baudelaire calls it for what it is. So as a poet and a gifted writer, uh, what Baudelaire does is identifies really what is at heart in the superiority theory, which is a kind of mortal and moral inferiority, right? It doesn't, it's not superior at all. And he says, laughter is satanic. So pretty heavy. It's pretty, you know, an arrogant expression on our part of our alleged superiority, right? Over animals, over each other. Uh, we, you know, look at ourselves as kind of rugged individuals and lighting up for the territory. And, you know, we decide to create meaning for ourselves. And ultimately, when we laugh at others, uh, Baudelaire thinks there's a degree of sort of satanic uh, or satanic quality to it. And what he's really referring to is the fact that how dare we, right? How dare we think that we are superior? Uh, and it comes from, you know, an idea that uh, relates very early on to the fall, uh, the fall from grace of man, uh, you know, being uh, ejected from the, the Garden of Eden. Uh, and these are sort of biblical stories, which is why Baudelaire says laughter is satanic. Notice it doesn't say evil, it says satanic, right? The idea of that Satan would do this. So there is in Baudelaire's idea, um, the fact that when we think we are superior, we're in fact inferior, right? We're laughing to compensate. We're laughing to make up for these shortcomings, you know, that we think we have, we think we are superior, but no, we're, we're not. So Baudelaire really kind of identifies what is at the heart of Plato's superiority theory by saying, no, it's us being satanic. So he says, laughter, they say, comes from superiority. It should not be surprising or surprised if on making this discovery, he had burst out laughing himself at the thought of his own superiority. Therefore, he should have said, laughter comes to the idea of one's own superiority, a satanic idea, if there ever was one, and what pride and delusion. So we are deluding ourselves in thinking that we are somehow superior to another person when we laugh at them. Now, it works only in terms of the superiority theory, which is why he calls it the inferiority uh, theory. But I think it, it's a sound one because it really describes what is at the heart of Plato's idea. And so what Plato was talking about in ancient Athens, not in the 1850s in France, was this notion of hubris. And hubris is basically pride, right? Just pure human pride. And when we are disp displaying this, this hubris, we're often do doing it through superiority and laughter, right? We're doing it through laughing at other people. And that's why Baudelaire looks at it as somehow being diabolical. So what both of them are saying ultimately, because they are kind of saying the same thing, that there is a degree of hubris, a degree of, of vain, vanity and pride in, in us when we try to laugh in this way. If we are laughing at absurdity and incongruity, that's different. But superior, superiority forms of laughter are really that. They're, they're, they're more satanic than really anything else. So, speaking of satanic, uh, Donald Trump's stand-up comedy special, it's about a minute long, if you can imagine. Uh, it's kind of a good, you know, it's a good example of what hubris is all about. The degree of pride. I mean, this guy is suffering from malignant narcissism. That is well past pride. But he is a perfect example of what would be considered the inferiority theory of all people. So we have in uh, Baudelaire's inferiority and Plato's superiority theories the same idea, the notion of hubris that uh, that people have 
And hubris, really, for, the, uh, for Baudelaire, is a kind of mental deficiency, right? How dare you? So have a look at that. It's about a minute or so long, and we'll see you back in a moment. Okay. So humor is not always a good thing. It may be the product, uh, Baudelaire says, of a devilish mind. Uh, and if that is the case, if laughter is satanic, that it does connect with some of the ideas that we've raised, especially in the humor and ethics part of our, uh, our I was going to say our program, of our uh, modules and our slides. Uh, sexist, ethnic, racist, homophobic jokes are the product of a, of a devilish mind, right? A satanic mind. Um, and so there is definitely connection, right, between those forms of humor and immorality. Because to be racist and uh, sexist and homophobic is, in our day and age, considered immoral. That somehow people have not, you know, emotionally or morally grown to some degree that they can at least tolerate, you know, other people. Uh, if you can't even tolerate difference to that degree and you have to laugh at it, yeah, that's being devilish, right? And Baudelaire is correct. Now, another uh, thinker that kind of followed along Baudelaire's lines, uh, Nietzsche would have been writing, uh, well, towards the very tail end of the 1800s. He died in 1900. So he would have been writing between about 1870s to, well, to, till he finally passed away. So let's say the last 30 years of the 19th century. And so what uh, Nietzsche does is he follows through some of the ideas that uh, Baudelaire has uh, presented. And he talks about the the way in which modernity now this is not post-modernity but modernity uh has really kind of changed the way we see the world we're looking at the world now through science and technology and industry and instrumental rationality where people are almost tricked into doing things because it's it's good for society um that's kind of where we're at in this case with with modernity because suddenly it's a very it's a subtle shift in the subjective relationship we have to the world around us. Modernity does that. And what's happening all of a sudden is we start thinking not in terms of human behavior, but in terms of utility and efficiency. And suddenly people now are, are just not resting. They're, they're wasting their time. They're, they're being lazy, right? That's, a, that's what modernity does. It subtly shifts our tensions away from what people are doing to kind of labeling what they're doing. And so when we're thinking of modernity and laughter, uh, Nietzsche says, you know, uh, when we are looking at the complexities of, of modernity and how it's changed the way we see the world, um, yeah, we should laugh because we recognize what's going on. And so uh, in the case of Nietzsche, because he was not a huge fan of religion, uh, he found that it really warped people's view, uh, he would ridicule Christianity and its moral rules for a whole range of reasons. But what he was doing was not, he was not uh, creating a parody because he cared about it. He was calling attention to it, that like modernity, people filter the world through a different lens. He says through religion, we're kind of doing the same thing, right? We're not seeing people for who they really are and accept them for who they really are. Now, with all of this, uh, Nietzsche still believed that life was a struggle. Uh, things were not always great. And this should kind of sound familiar. This should sound like Schopenhauer. Remember him from a few weeks ago and Kierkegaard. Uh, Nietzsche actually was a student of Schopenhauer and knew of uh, Kierkegaard's work as well. So that's why he too looked at the world as a kind of a constant struggle. And so as we exist and we try to be and be the best person that we can be, um, well, you know, sometimes it's, it's difficult. And just like Jean-Luc Nancy asks us to simply shrug our shoulders and laugh and just go, it's the best I can do. Well, here Nietzsche is kind of implying the same sort of thing that we should consider that maybe, you know, we should simply be joyful in what we have, right? In being human beings, having drives, desires, uh, you know, goals in mind. So if we can laugh at ourselves, it is often the first step towards becoming not only self-conscious of ourselves, but conscious of what we really want, right? Uh, we're not going to settle for just this. There's got to be something better. And so what Nietzsche does is he allows us to recognize that, yes, things may be a struggle, but sometimes those struggles are worthwhile. Some are worth overcoming simply because you, it will take you to a better place. 
right? Um, that hard work will pay off. And when it pays off, it's going to be worthwhile. So life, yes, is a series of struggles. Um, and when we laugh at it, right, it is a corrective. It is part of our awareness, our new awareness as to what's going on. It's a first step towards a kind of self-consciousness of who we are, our place in the world. And this clip here, uh, John Mulaney, uh, coming from his, uh, I think it's a comedy special, uh, Comeback Kid. Uh, again, maybe not on the degree of Nietzsche and, you know, um, metaphysical struggles with the universe, but something far simpler. But that's what humorists do, right? They take a small thing and they really explore it. So John Mulaney, um, with the idea of peace be with you, which is a saying that people often say to each other in church. And what happens when you kind of feel sort of... Uh, awkward and uh, kind of misplaced. So have a look at the John Mulaney piece and then we'll come back. Okay, so in the same way as Baudelaire talked about uh, laughter being satanic, and then we have transcendental laughter with Jean-Luc Nazi, which is this kind of metaphysical shrugging of shoulders going, I don't know. We have something called golden laughter. And golden laughter is a kind of laughter that comes out of our humanity, our, our humanness. Now, that could should sound familiar because it is taken from Bergson's idea. Now, Bergson was writing after Nietzsche had passed away. Uh, so Nietzsche had informed and influenced to a certain degree Bergson's ideas. Uh, but both of them are really looking at laughter in, in a very similar way. And the way in which they see it is that they see laughter as a kind of transgressive force, a creative force, that kind of élan vital, that, that vital force that makes us who we are. Because it is that vital force that we draw upon as we try to overcome the obstacles that, that arrive in our path as we live our lives. And we can laugh at some of the ones that are maybe in hindsight minuscule, right? Maybe we've made a mountain out of a molehill, right? You've heard that one before. So the idea for Nietzsche and much later with, uh, with Bergson uh, is that thoughts are not tragic. The obstacles are not tragic. We're not talking about hubris and pride here. We're talking about thinking on our feet, that kind of mental flexibility that comedians have and what philosophy can do for us. And if that is the case, even the obstacle, obstacles can have comic elements, right? There could be something just so ri ridiculous and absurd that you know, we don't think we can get we can get over it. But we try to realize that, okay, I'm not Superman, right? I will do the best I can, and I am only human, but I'm going to do the best I can, and the rest of it, I'm just going to laugh it off. So golden laughter is a kind of worldview. It's a way of perceiving the world in a particular way. And so what uh, Nietzsche says is, and supposing that the gods too philosophize, which has been suggested to me uh, by many in inference, I should not doubt that they also know how to laugh the while in a superhuman and new way and at the expense of all serious things. So regardless of who you are, man or Superman, which is the name of one of his pieces uh, in one of his books, Beyond Good and Evil, um, the notion of golden laughter is a recognition of our humanity, recognition that there are certain things that we can overcome and some that we cannot, but it is a recognition of us as human beings. So uh, sometimes at La Vital, you know, is we need it at the strangest times. And so Nietzsche's thoughts uh, are not tragic, but in fact, rather comic. Uh, this is the short clip, but it's about five or six minutes. Um, uh, Jeremy Holtz, a Canadian comic. Uh, this is from a Just for Laughs comedy uh, festival. And this is kind of observational humor. It's not particularly anthropological or maybe at the heightened degree of, say, a George Carlin, but still pretty funny because we recognize what he's talking about. And he puts himself, Jeremy Holtz, puts himself as the kind of the poor downtrodden, excuse me, downtrodden guy trying to, you know, get through the world and just doing the simplest things. And oh my God, everything is a struggle. Everything has to be something to be overcome. So it is just a whole series of little minor things, you know, getting an Ikea package or something, but it's how he riffs on it. And there is, you know, uh, humor as a way to push back, right? As a way to fight back, say like, you expect me this and what if that? That's how Jeremy Holt's work, uh, work, uh, 
how he's able to work through some of these these dilemmas, these obstacles that he has in his life. So have a look at that, and we'll see you back in a moment. Okay, so Nietzsche looks at laughter as part of just who we are. It's our humanity, our human life, our humanness, the way we look at ourselves, because there are simply certain things that we cannot explain, things that we cannot overcome, things that we are simply going to have to deal with. It is who we are. You know, we have a tendency to do this or that, or to say this or that, or react in a certain way, depending on what's going on. But it really is embracing our humanness, right? And that's a kind of Henri Bergson sort of thing, that élan vital, because Nietzsche doesn't call it that, but there is something that is uh, really similar in both of those thoughts. So uh, golden laughter and that élan vital kind of work really well together because they are about our ability to be creative around an obstacle as we kind of work our way through it, or if we're lucky, just around it. But it is what we would do as human beings, not as robots, not as machines, not as animals, but as human beings, because we are self-conscious human beings. We are aware of what we are doing as we try to overcome this obstacle. So here, uh, laughter becomes a kind of acknowledgement, you know, of life. It's joyous, it's golden, right? It's golden in the sense that it is an affirmation of life, just like Bergson's Henri Vital, uh, Henri v Ella Vital, sorry. Um, and this, you no, know, this refusal to, to just to bow down, to, to buckle down and say, I can't do it. Just keep trying. Because overcoming these obstacles is worthwhile, for Nietzsche at least. So laughter becomes a symbol of our desire to continue to live. So it's not really nihilistic. It's not depressive. It isn't like, oh my God, this is the end of the world. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Quite the opposite. It's a laughter going, you know, let's just see what we can do. Let, let's see what, what is the best we can come up with. Okay. So Nietzsche, if you can imagine this kind of laughter, especially if there's something that's really difficult to, uh, to overcome, depending on what, what may be, uh, it also includes, uh, like laughing at authority figures. And that's the postmodern part of it, which is quite remarkable. Now, uh, Hannah uh, Arendt, a uh, political philosopher, the woman you see here, uh, she has written, the greatest enemy of authority is contempt. And the surest way to undermine it is laughter. So there it is. And she was writing, she would have written that uh, in about the 1940s. So certainly 40 years after uh, Nietzsche was no, no longer, but there's a similar idea. We assert our humanity against all kinds of obstacles, including authority figures. And we assert our humanity and our humanness by sometimes the only weapon we have, our laughter. That's really what we can do. And when uh, people laugh at authority figures, yeah, kind of get uncomfortable, but for us, Oh, that feels great. It's just, it's quite nice. So I know these uh, hopefully don't sound too old, but if you can remember, a lot has happened in the last few years. But at one point, uh, Donald Trump went to, went to the United Nations to do the keynote spe uh, speech. And if you can remember, um, it didn't go so well. So this is from uh, Stephen Colbert about a year ago, The World Unites and Laughing at Trump. And remember what Hannah Arendt says, the greatest enemy of authority is contempt, and the surest way to undermine it is laughter. And here we have other people who are also uh, uh, figures of authority, laughing as at the biggest one, or the one who thinks he is the biggest. That's what makes it funnier. That's where that contempt is. So have a look at that. Uh, it's only a few minutes long, and uh, see you back in a moment. Um, Simon Critchley, uh, who is my age, 61, um, he also thinks along the same way as, as Nietzsche. It's an affirmative or an affirmation of our humanity, but like Jean-Luc uh, Jean Nancy, it's also an affirmation of the fact that human understanding is finite, is it has limits. There are only certain things we can know. And that doesn't mean stop reading after grade 12. And no, please carry on. But there are limits to human the human understanding. Because again, we interact with reality only through language. That's all we have. So Critchley thinks that laughter is an acknowledgement uh, of 
the limits that we have as people, limits that we have to, to the amount of knowledge that we have, that the world itself is limited in what we can know. And all of these people, whether it's Nazi uh, or Nietzsche and Critchley here, the, the laughter we're talking about is the same sort of, you know, it's the same type, right? We're, we're laughing at the limits. We're not stressing over it. We're not, uh, we're not anxious over it. We're simply laughing at this is the best we can do. And if in the postmodern world, there are no figures of authority and we are essentially on our own, right? Because we've got to kind of make it up as we go along and make sense of it ourselves. The world is limited in terms of who we can turn to. And so it does put us back in our place, but we can do it in a way that puts a smile on our face, right? And we can, we can laugh at the fact that there is only so much we can know. And trust me, the more you read, the more you realize how little you know. And that's, I mean, Socrates said that in the year, well, 398 BC. <laughs> so have we learned our lesson? Kind of not. We just keep on reading and learning. But there is a limit. And the limit now is not looked at seriously or tragically. It's looked at humorously. It's looked at this is this is who we are. This is who we are as as human beings. As we get older, remember, there's only so much room in our brain and let's face it in my case the more i read the more something else has got to leave right so that it can fit in my brain for a while and then when somebody asks me a question about a, a book i haven't cracked open in 25 years I'm kind of stuck right <laughs> like uh hold on a moment i run off to my library to get the book but the point is i know that there's only a, a limit to the amount of information that i can store in my brain at any given time is it tragic it could be but do i laugh at it sure and what I do is I tell someone the truth. Yeah, I know who that is. I haven't looked at the book in a quarter of a century, but if you can hold on a moment, I'll go get it. And you laugh and you you move on. So are we lowly and more and mortal? Absolutely. Because we're not robots. We're not giant brains that you know need to be fed on a daily basis. We're just human beings. So with Critchley, uh it is it is Nietzsche in, in the sense that it is kind of shrugging our shoulders. But it is not a kind of defiance because with Nietzsche, there is that degree of defiance in, in his work because he wishes to have us laugh going that, aha, you know, I will conquer this. Critchley is kind of bringing us kind of back down to earth a little bit. He says, okay, look, you know, our human condition, it, we're, we're mortals, we wear out, you know, we be, we get, we're, we, we're diseased at times and we eventually die. And you can look at the, that, you know, as a metaphysical tragedy. Or say, or say, okay, it is what it is. Let's move on. Hey, let, let's get on with it. So for Critchley, laughter, which is really more an awareness, a self-consciousness of our state of, you know, our condition in, in the world, it's an acceptance of life. That's really what it is. It's an acceptance that, you know, life is the way it is. Uh, chaos is never far away. Uh, and if we can be aware of that, we can kind of sort of maneuver through the world a little bit more carefully, uh, settle down on the obstacles that are worth fighting, right? The, wor the ones that are worth overcoming. And some of them just aren't. Some of them just are not worth fighting for. So if we can keep that kind of mental flexibility, we can laugh at some of the issues that would otherwise, in a different context, be somewhat of a tragedy. You know, we grow old and die. Oh, no. Well, yeah, if you sit around and just wait that wait for that to happen, that's, that is tragic. But if you live your life and do things and meet people and go places, that's much better. So the laughter is is the limits, the limits of our of our life, the limits of our understanding, uh, the limits of you know what we can do, right? The the skills we can learn, uh, the careers we can have. It could be tragic, but it is not, and it is not because we choose to laugh at it instead. Okay. One of the things that Critchley does talk about that does help is this notion of just the you know, the smile, just to smile at people. Uh, I know we've not been in school now for quite some time, but you have to admit when you're just walking down the hallway and you might not have had the best day ever, you know, best day in a, in a while, and you look up and you just kind of lock eyes with someone for just, just a few seconds and they smile. And what do you typically do? You smile back. It's, it's a nice feeling. It's an acknowledgement that there is someone else out there in the world. It isn't just you, 
but there are other people who maybe feel the same way. And the two of you lock eyes for a few seconds and you smile. And it's a kind of silent acknowledgement. I see you and, I, and I, I'm aware of your presence. And if it's just a smile, great. And it's modest, it's appropriate. I mean, you may stop and talk to someone, and especially these days, I don't know how often it's happened with you, uh, but uh, I just this morning uh, mistakenly called out someone, hey, Richard, and the guy turned and looked, uh, who? And I looked at him and, oh, <laughs> you're, you're not Richard. Same voice, same height, same sort of, uh, it was unbelievable. I was surprised it, was, it wasn't him. So we made a joke about it. We both went on our way, end of discussion. But sometimes just a smile. It's just an acknowledgement of your humanity by another person. And so, you know, we can rejoice in our wretchedness. Sounds like we're, you know, serfs that are covered in mud. Hopefully that's not your life, but just our human existence. To smile to another person really goes a long way. It presents to the other that we are human. It presents to the other our acknowledgement that we see them. And that goes a long way to just be acknowledged, you know, as a human being. Uh, it, it matters. It helps. It feels good. And so that's what Chris Lee is talking about when he talks about the smile and how it relates to humor and laughter, that it doesn't generate a, la a laugh necessarily, but a smile is sometimes a, an appropriate response to things that are going on. Now, in terms of smiling, um, I don't know who, if you know Ryan Hamilton. Uh, this is someone who you know, really talks about just life and uh, along the same lines as uh, Jeremy Holtz, um, but also uses his own self. He is because he does have a really interesting face, uh, kind of looks like a demented sort of howdy doody. And he's made jokes about it. And which is why I wanted to put this here, because yes, a smile may be modest and appropriate, uh, but he does call attention to the fact that when he smiles, he might sort of scare people. In fact, he opens his routine with exactly that. Uh, so we do acknowledge one another through laughter and smiling, but mostly smiling because it is quiet and, and doesn't even require words. Just, I acknowledge you. And so Ryan Hamilton kind of plays with that and just kind of talks about our, you know, our human frailties, which is again, a typical stand-up thing, but uh, really has fun with it. So have a look at this clip and then I'll see you back in a moment. So the first, last person we're going to look at is uh, Helmut Plesner. And Helmut Plesner talks about, uh, again, this should sound like people we've visited before, uh, Berkson for sure, that laughter is at the core of the human experience. It is who we are. It is how we are aware of ourselves, our mind, our body, uh, the fact that it's something that our minds and our bodies, maybe we can't control them to the degree that we would like to. And if you doubt me, uh, I'd love to meet someone who in the last year has had a good night's sleep. If you're like me, two o'clock in the morning, I should be asleep. I'm wide awake with my eyes closed, laying in bed with my brain spinning like a Rolodex. Million, a million things going through my mind. And apparently I'm not the only one. All of us are experiencing this. So uh, if if we want to laugh at it, I mean, I laugh at it in the middle of the day, but in the middle of the night, I wish it wasn't happening. But Plesner says that laughter really is it lies at the core, right, of our, of our human experience. Our limitations, you know, our, our shortcomings, our downfalls, especially the fact that some of these things that we experience, we, we kind of can't control. Um, and if we think we can, we have this maybe a false notion of our self, right, as being coherent and controllable, because it doesn't quite work that way. So when we think about our body and the way that it responds to various things, uh, our body can often be at the mercy of our mind. Our mind can make us think of all sorts of things. It can trick us into thinking that there is something going on when there, when there isn't. So our mind sometimes has the upper hand and it sometimes can control other things that occur physically that we would like to stop otherwise. So things that occur physically or physiologically, laughter and tears, crying are two different things. Um, it is a very deep awareness of our existence, our body responding to what is going through our minds. 
And what he's saying here, whether you're laughing or crying, the distinction between the mind and the body, which are two separate entities, literally collapse. It, it collapses into one because the, the body is expressing through itself, through its physical self, through laughter or crying, what is on your mind. So what I mean is when you're laughing, it's very easy to tell what, what your mindset is. When you're sobbing and crying, just as much. And so this is what he means when he says that laughter and tears are associated with an awareness of our physical existence and the way in which the mind breaks down the distinctions between something physical and something mental. Uh, when we are laughing and crying, that distinction is gone because the body expresses the mind in, in the clearest way possible. Now, you may have seen uh, this clip before. It's been watched many, many times. But when we talk about the uh, breaking down of the body and mind, um, this clip lasts about a minute. It's really cute. Called Charlie bit my finger. So have a look at that and you'll see exactly what Plesner means when you see the body respond. And we know absolutely what this person is thinking. So have a look at that and I'll see you back in a moment. Okay. Laughter. Uh, for Plesner is an intellectual activity. Um, earlier in the, the course, I asked you to, to dis make a distinction between is humor an emotion or not? Well, here is an argument that would say that it is not because Plesner also argues that laughter is more of an intellectual activity than crying. Crying does not require um, thought that generates it because if you get hurt, like in the case of Charlie bit my finger, it's spontaneous. Uh, it's almost like it bypasses the brain altogether. It, it bypasses the mind. And if something hurts, um, it hurts, right? And that's all that matters is the, the pain threshold is gone and the, something hurts. So what is happening here is laughter may be an intellectual activity that's still expressed through the body as laughter. But crying seems to short circuit that a little bit because crying is usually an emotional state of mind. And it is a total emotional immersion into whatever this activity is that is causing you to weep. Uh, it could be the loss of a loved one. You could be at a funeral. Um, and your, your mind, as much as you want to not do it, your mind says, can't, sorry, I have to, I have to cry. And you do. So what happens here is just in the same way that all the other thinkers have said the same thing, that we are at the limits of, of our understanding, our limits the limits of our control, right? The limits of our control over our body, our thoughts, our expressions. Sometimes there are things that we cannot control. Now, laughter can also occur at a funeral because suddenly you start thinking of something that you wish you hadn't, but the more you stop, you try to stop thinking about it, the funnier it gets. By the same token, right? The exact opposite would be crying. Crying is a total emotional immersion of the body and mind are literally one. It, in fact, it almost, like I said, it, it short circuits that, that the mind doesn't need to think about anything. It, it is expressing on a, almost on a pure state. So that is what kind of Plesner is talking about here. So, uh, comic laughter, something we've done all of our lives. There isn't a, a, a society that we know of, that maybe somewhere, who knows, a society that is not, that is not known laughter is one that really no one knows of or has heard of. So it is very much who we are, you know, uh, who we are. So uh, how we control that comic response, whether it's just a smile to another person or listening to a comedian or a full out laugh. Really, that's that's the, the, the degree of control we have over our bodies. Now to that, I'll say one last thing. If you've ever worked a night shift or it doesn't matter where it is, and you're, you're super tired and it's 3.30 in the morning, maybe 4 o'clock, and your shift isn't over for another three hours, and somebody starts talking about, I don't know, a fork. And suddenly you realize how goofy the word fork is. You just kind of start chuckling. And your friend isn't quite sure what's going on, and he keeps on talking. They might be waving the fork, and blah, blah, blah. And he's talking about the fork, and it just it, it's the most absurd thing. But you just start laughing. And the next person to you starts laughing as well. And the next thing you know, you can't control it. You can't, I mean, literally tears are streaming down your face. Uh, it, may, it doesn't even have to be a night shift. It can be, it can be all kinds of situations where you're just kind of caught off guard, off guard and your mind is 
for some reason, unable to process the kind of, I don't know, ordinariness of what you're talking about. And some other part of your brain kicks in and now you've lost control. You start laughing and you can't stop laughing. You literally tears rolling down your face and you can't stifle it anymore. I'm sure you've seen lots of epic fail videos of newscasters that start laughing at something and they just lose it. They lose their shit and it's hysterical. That's what Plesner is talking about. At one point in the same way crying is that total immersion of a physical you know, response to something, laughter can sometimes be the same. It is a total response. You have lost control. You've lost mastery of your body. So that's essentially what I wanted to say for these slides. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the videos uh, and we will see each other on uh, Monday. And if you have any questions, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the last, um, the last uh, number four reflection that's going to be coming up, I believe, this coming Sunday. I'm almost done my reading. I'm going to be done by this afternoon. So you'll start seeing some marks even as early as this evening for your uh, third uh, reflection essay. So take care and we'll talk to you soon.